Good afternoon, everybody. We don't want to waste any time. This speaker is full of information. In this course, it's our task to study many historical genocides, to learn about them and, I hope, from them. Today, we turn our focus to a genocide in the making that is happening as we speak. Syrians murdering Syrians, ISIS mur slaughtering Yazidi, and this is only one spot on the globe where genocide takes place at this moment. On the 103rd anniversary of the Armenian Genocide, April 24th, you remember our speakers talking about that, we must face the realization that never again is a wish, it is most certainly not a reality. And that's what makes it all the more imperative that we, yes, in this country, learn to understand the signals of genocide, because it can happen anywhere. Our speaker today is well known around these parts. Our man in the media, Professor David McEwen. Dr. McEwen's specialty is direct democracy and more broadly, American politics. He gives thanks every morning that we elected Donald Trump because every morning, NPR, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Le Monde, and Channel 2 are calling Dave and saying, what is this tweet? What is this man talking about? And Dave tells them, better him than me. Professor McEwen's interests are broad. He is also an observer of the Middle East. He teaches a very popular course at this university on terrorism, also US foreign policy and international politics. He spent considerable time in Israel and a few years ago was a recipient of the Schusterman Fellowship to study and travel there. We are very glad that he has taken time from a very busy schedule to speak to us today of the trauma that is Syria. Please welcome Professor David McEwen. How are we doing? You hear that? Okay. So I have a tendency to go too fast, um, say too much, too quickly. Um, all of it hugely important with lots of maps and lots of data. So don't be afraid to stick your hand up and tell me that uh, I'm wrong, uh, that uh, slow down or repeat something. Uh, I'll provide all the materials that you need to Dr. Parnes, uh, lectures, what, uh, lecture notes, whatever, all these slides, uh, happy to do it. What we're going to cover a lot of stuff. Uh, as of this morning, uh, this topic is changing, whether it's in the Rose Garden uh, with uh, the leader of France, Emmanuel Macron, whether it's what's happening on Capitol Hill, uh, what you read in the news, what's happening in the Pentagon, or what's happening in, in Syria or the area around there. So we'll talk about, more broadly, a conception of changes in conflict. The United States doesn't go to war anymore. Yes, we have lots of conflict that's ongoing and lots of wars that we fight. But the idea of war has changed dramatically. War generally involved belligerence in which you would have recognized rules, codes of conduct, notions of proportionality, conduct that was created or at least legislated as best it could be, especially after World War II with the Geneva Accords and with subsequent rules around things like laws of armed conflict, LOAC. All of that has kind of gone out the window. So what I will do is start with a concept called hybrid warfare or hybrid conflict. Think of notions of war and the bad things that happen with war as going away. And so you've heard all semester about the, the tragedy of the Holocaust, the cultural identity and elements associated with that, about violence, about horrible case studies related to Cambodia, Armenia, about occasions of gendered Holocaust components or gender components around rape and violence. So think about violence as a huge conflict or set of engagements that has changed dramatically. 
especially in the wake of 9-11, especially in the demise of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War. Since that period of time, the last 20 to 30 years, we have been involved, been involved with perpetual conflict in which the rules and norms have been relaxed. What we do around waterboarding and torture, what we do around the engagement of information, the use of information warfare and dissemination, how the Russians treat different elements of their population or elements of their old territory under the Soviet Union. And that all has spilled over from Iraq into Iran, into Syria, into Yemen, into the Horn of Africa, in and out of Afghanistan, into Pakistan, and it has created basically from Morocco to the Philippines an arc of instability. And we will think about the arc of instability and what is happening in the arc of instability as a huge challenge to our notions of international norms and conflict. It challenges, and you see this with the current administration, it challenges how we deal with nation states and how nation states deal with non-state actors, how quasi-private institutions, quasi-private uh, armies, mercenaries, how uh, the whole conduct of war and conflict has been, if you will, uh, sent out and contracted out to a whole set of organizations and entities that really don't fit under international law and don't subscribe to IHL, International Humanitarian Law, or International Human Rights Law, IHRL. These are some of the concepts that I teach about in the terrorism class. So we'll kind of walk through this with a broad framework and then apply this to the case of Syria and look at some of the complicating elements to Syria. And obviously, with the events of Friday the 13th, when the United States, Great Britain, and France attacked Syria, we'll place that in the context of what happens moving forward and what's happened in Syria, in the particular case of the Yazidis, uh, and ISIS and ISIL, together with their challengers or their rival groups, uh, offshoots of Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra Front. So that's kind of the plan uh, for, this, for this afternoon. <coughs> okay, first, exactly one year ago, today, the United States and President Trump decided to arm the Syrian Kurds, exactly one year ago. Uh, and at that time, uh, we angered the Turks. So how do you think the Turks responded over the last year? And the Turks are a NATO member. So the Turks have been engaged in Syria. And how many US troops are in Syria? Around 2,000 US troops, special operators, that have been engaged there, while also being engaged in the western part of Iraq. And as this has unfolded over the last year, and since about April 17th of last year, the United States has been engaged in a proxy war working with various groups in Syria combined with other elements from Russia, Iran, You'll, I'll show you the bases, you'll see what happened, and then we'll see the lead up to what happened prior to Friday the 13th and what happened after Friday the 13th. All of this really begins about February of 2012 into 2013, and by the summer of 2014, ISIS is on the march from Raqqa and in elements and areas of Iraq all the way through into Syria and ISIS is on the move and marching, creating a cabinet, creating a government, and engaged in genocidal attacks against those that they don't believe are the true Quranic believers, the true believers of the Quran, particularly the Yazidis, but also other groups and other elements, Christian groups most notably, throughout that area. Syria is compounded by this as a result of the populations that are there. So it's an important case study or test case for what we can learn about how genocide has changed, how norms of con conduct, expectations under laws of armed conflict, expectations of international humanitarian law and international human rights law, expectations of what should happen are challenged exactly by this case, especially with all these groups. What you have in Syria is a dog's breakfast of different operators, of different operators and different entities and countries all jockeying for position. What's the dominant view? Of, of Islam in Iran? Are they Shia or Sunni? Take a stab, you got a 50-50 shot. Shia. But when I show you a map of Syria, you're gonna see dominant Sunni populations. Why are they operating then in Syria if they're opposed to Sunni populations? And why are the Russians operating there as well? Some element of this is oil, but it's not all about energy. It's about this arc of instability and changes in conflict and the spillover effects from what happens in Iraq, which happens into northern Iraq, into southern Iraq, which happens in the Saudi Peninsula all the way down to Yemen, which affects the Horn of Africa, which obviously affects what's happening throughout North Africa, 
which affects what's happening going on in Lebanon, in Syria, in the southern border of Turkey. So we use the Syrian test case for what's happening as a dramatic example of where genocide is headed and what is happening. And that's why we'll look at it today. <clears throat> so if we look at this case study, we see a few things, okay? We know there are war-related atrocities or conflict-related atrocities. We know that there are clear war crimes, the latest being elements of uh, chemical weapons attacks uh, in Damascus and outside Damascus, the manufacture of, of uh, chemical weapons, the presence of chemical weapons, some of which may be held by Russia or at least uh, winked, wink, nudge, nudge by the Russians at some level, and other elements too, including the Iranians. And you have uh, extrajudicial killings going on, you have uh, violence against women, you have uh, violence against all kinds of populations, all uh, that could be prosecuted under the war crime and the International Criminal Court and the proceedings that we might see here, okay? Specifically, you would see war crimes under Article 8, if that's what you're looking for in this element for the Syrian case. Now we move forward and see what and how this is able to operate, how this is able to proceed in light of, think of everything that you've learned this semester and all the different test cases that you've seen. Uh, Rwanda comes at the end. So you see how major powers are able to influence these events or not influence these events, and especially in the wake of 9-11, in the never-ending phase of the war, of the never-ending phase of the global war on terror, the never-ending war, and what's happened, say, since the early 90s and certainly after 9-11, this perpetuation of conflict that is ongoing and ongoing and ongoing and has both violent measures and nonviolent components to it. So there's a lot of components here about how we conduct conflict, and that's another reason that Syria is so instructive. <coughs> All right, so now let's take this case and kind of set a theoretical framework of what, is, what do we mean by hybrid war? And I'm gonna show you two components to this that are particularly applicable to Syria, but also think more broadly about what has happened, say, since the Arab Spring, or with the rise of ISIS, or with previously uh, Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda in Mesopotamia, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, all right, different offshoots of this, and how this was able to percolate really forward from World Trade Center One, the first World Trade Center bombing in 1993. So the idea is that we have this component called hybrid war, or hybrid conflict. We'd really kind of like to relax the idea of hybrid war, but talk about hybrid conflict. It's conflict that really is, has several different components. It doesn't really fit the components of aggression as laid out by the UN. Because it has this information component, or because it has this psychological component, because it has this component to it that is multifaceted, it doesn't fit traditional measures of international law and conceptions of aggression. Countries, in other words, and non-state actors and different groups and entities have found ways to get around international conventions that govern conflict. They've been learning entities and learning organisms, learning organizations. What happened yesterday in Toronto? Right, with the ban, or that we've seen in the UK, in London, or we've seen all over the world. Affiliated or inspired types of attacks of how to move and operate, not necessarily affiliated in a terror group or with a terror entity, but influenced by, or inspired by, these extremist or terror-like organizations. And that means the principal component of this hybrid warfare is what mechanism to communicate this? The internet. So I will show you some things in the internet, some things you should not go look at at home, but things you should go look at, uh, if you will, uh, in the library at SSU, or come by my office, or maybe Dr. Parnes's office, or maybe your exes, you would go to their house and you would do it there. <laughs> but I will show you some things that you can look at, but please look at them in a public uh, arena or a public space because that's, our government's very interested in who's looking at those things because of this idea of being inspired or influenced, if you will. So aggression. It has a traditional conception of a respect for territories, a respect for laws or agreed upon boundaries, and we're talking about conflicts that ignore those boundaries. Talking about uh, the movement of aggression or the movement of conflict and violence that really ignores any kind of accepted norms. That means civilians are entirely an acceptable target, not acceptable under international law, not acceptable under norms or expectations of behavior, but now they become targets because they create what's known as the CNN effect. We become scared, and this has, if you will, a spillover component because it terrorizes populations. And so if you can take one entity or one group and create from them a sense of terror amongst other populations, you can subjugate those populations to different 
uh, regulations or rules, or you can, if you will, become a totalitarian-like regime. This is exactly the goal that ISIS has. This is exactly the, when you read the fatwas by bin Laden, the uh, idea that he envisioned at some point long, long ago when he was in Sudan and then later in Yemen and then in Saudi Arabia. <coughs> So hybrid war has these elements of insurgency, guerrilla war, civil war, ethnic religious uh, conflict, things that have been with us really kind of uh, from the time we came out of the cave. All right, They've been with us the whole time. Sectarian strife, domestic terrorism, they have lots of different components. And they create this idea in international relations theory and international law called the strategic dilemma. Your participation in them, your presence in them create this strategic dilemma where you likely to exacerbate a solution or exacerbate the situation itself. You have violent and nonviolent aspects of the hybrid because the principal component and messaging around this is the use of the internet. So I'll show you lots of things on the internet where you can find information, but it's this promulgation of information, this passage of information using the power of the internet that allows us to inspire and create spillovers or allows uh, extremist groups to do this. So think about this definition. And then I'm going to show you some things that are very interesting from 2013 and 2014. Information is the currency of this type of conflict. So you need to communicate, right? That means that the United States government and elements of the United States government communicate with terror groups every day and with extremist groups every day. It means the Israelis communicate with Hezbollah every day. It's just a matter of course. It's not official. It's unofficial. But the treatment of those entities and organizations as quasi-states or quasi-leaders in some sense, governments is a normal course of business for the exchange of information. It means, for example, we don't negotiate with terrorists, but we talk to them all the time to understand what they think and how, and they can understand our information. And so there's a communications game that goes on, a high stakes communication game, an, osmos an osmosis or osmotic effect that occurs. This includes the leakage of misinformation and its presentation in a positive light. This demoralizes citizens, leads to negative feelings, and in the short run provides defection to the side of the aggressor. Pay attention to this component right here. What does that sound like to you? Think of the 2016 presidential election. Yeah, it sounds like a Russian bot, doesn't it? Check this out. This is a slide from a presentation by a Russian general in February 2013 about hybrid warfare. The Russians have been there a long time. This is exactly the model they're using in Syria. This is exactly the model that they are using and that groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda have used and watched as well. The creation of quasi-governments and quasi-legitimacy to provide social services and economic hope, to provide, if you will, websites and Facebook pages and YouTube channels that communicate what your group believes is a normal course of business. The Russians have been here for a long time. How do they use this? Here's the second slide from that Russian general's presentation. The creation and funding and development of far-right groups in Europe. So what's happening is the Russians, in terms of doctrine, have been in this hybrid warfare for a long time and been battling the West with it. This isn't a Trump phenomena. This isn't a Russian bot phenomena. But this is used and copied and studied by serious people in the Pentagon by serious people in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem, by serious people in Berlin, France, in Moscow, and in Leningrad, as well as Damascus, Djibouti, <laughs> Argesa, Somalia, areas of Lemon, uh, Yemen, Lemon, Yemen, all over the world. The point here is that even lemons can learn about how to. Even lemons, anyone can learn how to engage in hybrid warfare from this doctrine. And who created this hybrid warfare kind of idea? It was created by a couple of people, an American and um, an Australian. Bruce Hoffman is an American who's maybe the principal expert on terrorism. I had him as a professor at various programs uh, studying terrorism. Uh, Bruce, uh, you'll see Bruce on uh, the Lair News Hour all the time. He's on TV. He's a military historian, uh, trained at Oxford, an American uh, based at Georgetown, uh, and uh, is maybe uh, the expert in the world on terrorism and creates this idea that, you know, he writes his first book about terrorism prior to 9-11. He writes an update in 2006. But he's, look, war has been changing a lot. And we're not keeping up with it in terms of a doctrine. 
in, in 2005, we are losing in Iraq and getting our butts kicked. And Hoffman creates with C Colonel Kilcullen the Petraeus strategy. The Petraeus strategy leading to dealing with the insurgency in Iraq. And that insurgency, anti-insurgent, counterinsurgency strategy in Iraq involved paying off groups, similar to what we had done in Vietnam, and also had been involved in engaging in tactics that were uh, problematic with international law in terms of how we treated terror groups and what we did with insurgency groups. Having them battle against one, one another and sometimes relaxing the norms and engaging in what was called enhanced interrogation techniques. All in the effort to create and foster this counterinsurgency, anti-insurgency campaign. <coughs> Colonel Kilcullen is a, an Australian, uh, still on staff or uh, the payroll, however you want to think of it, to the Pentagon and has been involved in creating uh, a whole host of doctrines and ideas about this uh, change in how groups can conduct war in the hybrid warfare environment. Some of the principal architects of this are right down the road at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey. Trying to get deep thinking going about how conflict has changed. And the Syrian case is a dramatic testimony to that and what has happened. It creates what's known as the accidental guerrilla syndrome. The accidental guerrilla syndrome, where they fight not because they hate us, but because they have their space has been invaded and groups can create and provide economic hope, empowerment, a whole series of things that the force of arms uh, previously held against them, now they can take up and rise up. Which means when you overtake a population or when you go back into areas previously held by ISIS, what happens to former, former ISIS fighters? Where do they go? Accidentally back into the population. Which means you're in a perpetual cycle of conflict and a perpetual run, if you will, uh, and run the perpetual cycle of this violence that creates and moves on and on, creating or exacerbating this strategic dilemma. So what you create is, is not really a hybrid, but what? A hydra that goes on and on and on. So it spills over from Syria to other areas, southern Turkey, Horn of Africa, Yemen, the full-blown civil war that's going on in Yemen right now, being conducted by the Iranians and the Saudis, essentially as proxies for Russia and the United States and other elements here going on in Yemen. <coughs> so you start to see these test cases. So as things occur in Syria, they spill over or lessons are learned, the internet is used, and that spills over further, exacerbating this Hydra situation. Here are, the, here are their inspirers or their inspirations. So you know who the guy on the top left is. Obviously Osama bin Laden. Who's the guy on the right? The one I Sheikh, Muqtad Bakmar, who uh, engineered the Algerian gas plant attack, the grab and hold attack that took place for four days in Algeria, where they targeted Westerners. That was a result of an inspirational memo received by Al Qaeda Central, sent to him, where he was asked to create a spectacular attack that, that indicated and illustrated his capability for management. The inspiration for that memo came from an article in the Harvard Business Review, just to give you an idea. They read our stuff, and we read their stuff. These are learning organizations that are learning how to produce genocide and produce violence in a most effective way that doesn't violate international law or sets those standards aside. Governments do this, professional military and intelligence folks do this, and so do the people we don't like. They all engage in this element. The bottom left, the Boston bomber, bombers, and their training, and then the one brother remaining underneath the uh, boat in Boston when he's captured. When they shut down the city of Boston for how many days? Five, six days. They shut down a major US city in a manhunt that goes on. This is just to give you an idea of the learning effect that goes on and why Syria as a test case of all that is happening is so instructive for all these groups. And who's that? There he is. With 15 of his 22 siblings. Any idea where that is? Don't you see the, it's Berlin. It's Berlin, where they traveled from London, all right? So you have travel going on, you have communications going on, just trying to give you an idea of the osmosis. Okay, I know you're scared out of to death now, but nonetheless, okay, it's to give you an idea of how this process has been working for some period of time. Just comes to fruition with Syria. This is just the setup. So look what we have, mass killing of civilians political assassinations, indiscriminate attacks, 
chemical weapons or weapons of mass destruction, however you want to characterize it. Lots of different things. The Russians are testing weapons in Syria and using proxies to do it. So are the Iranians. This is exactly what occurred in Iraq in 2005 with those improvised explosive devices that could run up through at the bottom of U.S. armored vehicles because they were all armored on top and on the sides and could explode inside with explosive penetrators. This learning process going on and then communicating. This creates, obviously, a displacement crisis. <clears throat> this is traditionally how we've looked at this, as a civil war. Even old and new models of civil wars don't work for the Syrian case. The old model doesn't work because you don't have broad popular support. You have cutting populations or cross-cutting populations and cross-cutting cleavages as a result. Even in new civil wars, you do have gratuitous violence. You do have dispersed public uh, pub popular support, but you don't always, always have private looting or private impetus here. This is where the hybrid model is very helpful in instructing what is going on. Because what is the Syrian case? It's a civil war. It's an insurgency. It's terror. It's ethnic conflict. It's religious strife. It's all of those things rolled into one. <clears throat> and here's the areas of control. I try to give you like the most up-to-date maps uh, and sense of what's happening because the case is literally changing this morning and it was changing on Friday the 13th and it was changing in March. So if you notice here what you have going on, <clears throat> let's see if I can. You have changes. This is from the Institute for the Study of War, uh, study of uh, Institute for the Study of War.org. If you're interested in going there, and uh, what you will notice is where the Syrian army is operating, where Kurdish forces are operating, Syrian rebels and jihadists in the purple, Turkish and Syrian rebel allies, and notice the change for Turks, the Turkish area, the top left of the map on the left, the top left of the map, sorry, on the right just to give you some idea what's happening, where the Turks have been engaged in incursions. Again, the Turks being NATO allies and, and friends of ours, nominally, with a very difficult situation in that area. <coughs> and what do you notice about the areas in which they operate? Notice these narrow areas. I think last year I showed some map, some road maps, like from the AAA of Australia, because those are roadways and river value, ba valleys where you can travel, previously held by um, ISIS. And here's January. <coughs> Notice what the Syrian government was. Where were they allied? Around Damascus in the south, around Lebanon. And the Syrian opposition forces were up where? Near where the Turkish areas were operating. And notice those little American flags. U.S. coalition military. Okay? This is January of this year. All right? Don't worry, I'll show you March and April of this year. You can see what's happening and how dynamic the situation is. Remember, the president wanted us out of Syria one month before Friday the 13th. He wanted us out of there. <coughs> U.S. forces in Syria, notice how we've moved. Sorry, let me give you back the big picture. So we're going to move, if you will, to the northeast. Because those are, uh, if you will, uh, ISIS Raqqa area, or ISIS ISIL areas, okay? Moving into those areas. M4 is the highway, just so you know, all right? <coughs> to give you some idea of what's happening in the map down below. <coughs> you ready? So what do you notice? You're not all strategists and generals, but it doesn't take a rocket science scientist to see what's happening here. Not that they're rocket scientists, but look at it. Where did the Russians go? South and around Damascus in those areas. So right in the middle is a buffer zone, if you will, a purposeful bu buffer zone. So if you were ISIS or Al-Qaeda or Al-Nusra Front, where would you go? Right in the buffer zone. That's exactly where you would go. Indeed, that's exactly what's happened since that period of time. Notice this down here. Where's the United States moving? Some forces? Down below. If you were the Russians, how would you take that? Yeah, not well at all. So you have learning going on by entities and organizations, and you have learning going on by major powers. Oh, 
And you got the Iranians there too. <coughs> and not a small amount of Iranians. So if you're gonna strike Syria with missiles, 130 were shot. How many were shot down, by the way? 78. 130 missiles were shot by the United States, the Brits, and France, and 78 of them were shot down. That's a big number, okay? That means they have a very effective anti-aircraft, anti-missile system in Syria. Why? Because the Russians and the Iranians are testing their latest weapons in that area. It's a serious shit show going on there, sorry. There's a lot of cool stuff, I apologize. All right, there's a lot of stuff happening there. And we're not even to the ethnic conflict genocide yet. We're just to the great powers. Oh, there's where the chemical weapons are. <coughs> what I need to do is take this map and superimpose where the Russians are at relative to it. I didn't have time, I haven't done that, I will work on doing that, but that's the map we need to see how close the Russians are. The Pentagon has this, the intelligence community has this, NATO has this. Uh, we don't get access to it at Sonoma State, okay? But we'll work on creating that map. <coughs> Here's the US attack last time I was here. <coughs> and I'm gonna compare the attacks side by side, just so you can see them. <coughs> All right. Here's what happened in those attacks, high-profile chemical attacks. This was President Trump's first go around. Here's the comparison. There were actually, when this graphic was made, there were 130 that were ultimately launched. How long did the attack take, this attack on Friday the 13th? Three minutes. It's a three-minute attack. It was huge, right? Three minutes. <coughs> Nine buildings destroyed. <coughs> and again, 78 of the 130 were shot down. Globalsecurity.org if you want the site. <coughs> and this is the position of countries on that strike. The red are countries that oppose the strike. The United States, Great Britain and France being participants, that's the dark green and then the regular green as supporters, and then those countries that were neutral. <coughs> what do you notice about Yemen? Does anyone know where Yemen is on the map? See Saudi Arabia there, kind of in green? See Yemen? The official government position is neutral. <laughs> in the midst of a civil war against elements of ISIS and Iran and elements related to those that are involved in Syria. Wow. This looks like a big problem. Here's air traffic the day before. <coughs> they knew we were coming. Always look at air traffic when you think we're going to attack the day before an attack or 48 hours before an attack because notices are sent out to civil air authorities about what's going on to clear airspace and governments know that but it's always a tip off and a clue. And notice that the air <laughs> around Syria is cleared out. This is 24 hours before the attack. You can chart this online using the Google tools, just so you know. Be a great paper, by the way, because it's a signaling tool, just so you know. All right, here's what happened after the strike. What's the situation in the Mediterranean? There's a lots of forces in the Mediterranean. U.S., British, French, and the Russians. Notice everyone carving up the space with a buffer zone in the middle. The United States is pushing. And in the middle of this, is the country that is bordered on the north by Lebanon and the south by Egypt and the Sinai, the Israelis. So you might guess that they're pretty nervous at this whole situation. And the Jordanians, where the percentage of the Jordanian population that's under 35 is almost 40%. All right? Huge upheaval going on. <coughs> oh, don't forget this, the oil and the proposed pipelines. Not the one in the south, which has been shut, shuttered, but the one in the north. <coughs> because there are broader plans for what to do here. Here are the broader plans. For a Russia-backed pipeline and a US-backed pipeline. 
This graphic is from February 14th, 2018. Happy Valentine's Day. <coughs> Just to take you through the Russians and what they were doing in Damascus. You see those Russian airstrikes? This is uh, the city of Damascus. You see the air. Hold, oh, please. You see the area of Tal Kurdi? Sorry. Hold on a second. Here's what was going on. Here's what was going on in 2017. Here's what was going on in 2017 and 2015. You're all awake now? Okay. All right. So here's Syria today. This is to give you an idea of what's happening with the populations relative to religion or religious practice. And remember that buffer zone in that area around El Raqqa and the Raqqa province? <coughs> and the distribution of forces as a result. So that top area that's kind of green, yellowish, that runs to the southern border of Turkey all the way over to Iraq. Spill over to Iraq, to the western edge of Iraq, all the way over to Kirkuk, and you have an element of Kurdistan, Kurdish-related areas, Kurdish forces, together with Kurdish populations, together with the Yazidi population, which is a Kurdish-speaking minority group, all in that area. The United States and the Brits operated in that area during the Iraq war. <coughs> and see the Kurds pushing forward here in February 2018 to control that area, to grab elements from ISIS and ISIL around Raqqa, but the Islamic State moving, especially down the area of Palmyra and other elements headed up to Turkey. Just to give you some idea what's happening here. The Russians positioned on the sea, mostly in most cases, together with this shows you ISIS and their extent of their influence. So if you were the Trump administration, if you were the West, you'd argued what has happened to ISIS since you took over the presidency and won in 2016 since 2017. They have rolled back ISIS. That's exactly their argument. That had been going on slightly before that time. But ISIS reaches its peak of influence about 2015 in this area, controlling an area that's huge, the size of Great Britain. All right, with limited forces in those river valleys. Grabbing those different areas, especially, if you will, into, from the border, from Syria into Iraq, in the area around Mosul, Dahuk, and the southern Turkish border. Creating a huge refugee crisis as a result creating a borderless conflict involving the targeting of populations by ISIS really at the height by summer 2014. Millions of people living in those areas and attacking a group called the Yazidis. <coughs> but this role of ISIS and attacking these populations is something we had seen with affiliated groups in Morocco, in Libya, in Egypt in Somalia, in Yemen, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan. Some of these groups affiliated with the MB, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, influencing a whole host of areas in the Sinai, as well as Western Libya, and continuing to do that today. In other words, ISIS seems to pop up all over the place, or ISIS-affiliated and inspired groups through the power of the internet popping up all the time with techniques. 
And in the Yazidi case, they were hugely effective at the genocide going on there. <coughs> the Yazidi being a Kurdish-speaking group, about 30 million. Significant populations. And when you look at this, where these Kurdish diaspora commu communities are, the, where they're distributed, what do you notice about your curriculum <laughs> and the discussion in different groups and the different case studies with these countries? They're scattered throughout this area or throughout those case studies, right? Similar Kurdish culture, a combination of different religious traditions, And this is exactly what ISIS does. A small population, isolating many of those Christian populations and then going after the Yazidis. 5,000 men and boys in Sinjar, number of uh, villages massacred. There's a website that documents this. If you're interested in it, I'm happy to send it to you. Not in very nice pictures. Grabbing the men first, and as many as 1,000 women and girls, either shooting them, killing them, or enslaving them. <coughs> like we see in other elements or other areas, like we've seen with other genocides. Wiping out this religious and ethnic group, doing their best to do so. <coughs> Displacing the arable lands, salting the earth, if you will, and teaching how to use suicide bombers and using the suicide bombers effectively and destroying religious icons and sites thousands of years old, taking control of the population through terror. And one of their biggest hauls was in the city of Mosul, a city very close to Baghdad with the famous Mosul Dam. And just prior to that, declaring itself a caliphate. I think some of you have studied ISIS or ISIL, some of uh, elements of that. I can show some of that as well. But that struggle is now over. Iraqi government-backed forces have retaken Mosul symbolically very important in northern Iraq and to the Kurds and to the United States and its ability to demonstrate its capability to train forces. Same thing happening around Raqqa, if you will, in eastern uh, Syria. <coughs> this gives you an idea of some of the genocide perpetuated in those areas, mass killings, paramilitary groups operating, Huge displacements again in those mass refugee movements, similar to what we've seen, even though this population hugely displaced. The Yazidi being much smaller than the general Kurdish speaking populations of 30 million that displaced all over in that area. <coughs> and this has not just been perpetuated by ISIS or ISIL but elements of ISIL operating in Syria that involve the old Al-Qaeda, or Al-Qaeda Central, and offshoots of Al-Qaeda Central and Al-Qaeda proper, like Al-Nusra Front. So you'll see this interchangeably in the news. Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, ISIS, ISIL. And you might remember what Secretary uh, of State John Kerry used to call uh, ISIS? D-A-E-S-H, Dash? Dash, you remember that? There's a reason for that, and I'll show you that as well. There's a reason for using that language, because it has a lot of connotations in Arabic, the principal one of those being donkey, if you follow it, okay? This is done by on purpose. <coughs> the elements of ISIS going back to the 7-7 attacks in London, Daesh or ISIS forming out of this in Al-Qaeda in June of 2014, there's essentially a break, if you will, that goes on. But Al-Qaeda has always been more like uh, McDonald's, uh, the burger place, with a series of affiliated burgers that you go out to. So think of it as a, as a model of inspiration in which groups affiliate or uh, copy or mimic and use similar techniques. And from that spins out in the insurgency from the Petraeus strategy 2004, 2005, 2008, and spills over to other areas like Yemen, Somalia, Libya, and so on, especially Western Libya. <coughs> And uh, Dr. al-Baghdadi declaring himself the caliph, the leader of the caliphate of 1.8 uh, billion Muslims. They created de facto government. <coughs> Here's their early years. In that summer of 2014 when they are expanding from Raqqa in Syria, east across the border into Iraq, 
and joining up with forces from Mosul in that area, attacking the Yazidis, massacring uh, a number of villages and taking them over, killing individuals and then taking them over through terror, if you will, controlling the water, controlling the power, and limiting that use so that their fighters had the ability to uh, receive those resources. The CIA announcing in September at the end of this that they had with around 30,000 fighters, 20 to 30,000 fighters. A ton of beheading videos, you might remember uh, several elements of this. The burning of the Jordanian pilot that occurred uh, in December 2014. <coughs> All punctuated or promulgated by this rivalry going on of Sunni and Shia populations. The point is to show you that we have these recognized borders, this borderless conflict, not recognizing those at all. In addition, there are tribal elements here, clan-based elements. We don't just see this in, in Somalia. We see this in elements throughout Sa the Saudi Peninsula and in elements throughout Afghanistan and Pakistan, complicating it. Here's the five-year plan from Daesh. This was in the Daily Mail, but taken from their English language website, okay? Which means they have a constitution and a set of beliefs which you can Google from a public place at the university or the home of your ex, all right? <coughs> Notice Spain and Andalusia, Andalus, and the Maghreb. And the division, if you will, of caliphates. That's what this is, the division of states or countries. With a global campaign of coordinated attacks. These aren't crazy people. They're smart, strategic actors. But terrorism doesn't pay. Strategically, it's a lost leader. It's a, it, there's, no, there's no gain from exchange here. So the question is, why do it? This is the declared provinces of ISIS at their height. Again, rolled back. But the idea is that they move back into the populations. There are negotiations going on between the Syrian government and elements of ISIS today, right now, while fighting goes on. And when ISIS doesn't like the way the negotiations go on, they bomb or use artillery in certain areas against civilian populations and villages, not just the Yazidis, but other populations as well, to indicate they're not happy with how negotiations are going at the bargaining table. But they target purposely civilians. This is to show you again that wide area. An institute for the study of war graphic from the Wall Street Journal indicating that wide area where special operations forces and US forces have been operating in those river valleys where ISIS was at its peak of control. All right, let's look at ISIS just for a bit. A quasi-state or a state needs money, right? And so they have extortion, taxation. They took over oil fields. At the height of oil production in Syria, almost 400,000 barrels of oil were produced per day at its height. Currently, it's between 20 and 30,000 barrels of oil, as much as 35,000. And the Russians have, been, have exclusive rights and ownership as of February 2018 to all Syrian gas and oil programs. They have exclusive rights, which came at the expense of Royal Dutch Shell and a few other Western oil companies who had shared rights in those areas. But ISIS had been grabbing this for some time and selling the oil, embargoed and unavailable through some of those areas, smuggling it, which means they needed to be able to transport the oil because it's a, a commodity that requires a huge logistical chain, a black market logistical chain. Dash being an Arabic word in its own right, so what do you notice about that picture? What's it look like? It looks like a donkey with al-Baghdadi's beard. Okay? But it has multiple meanings, trample, crush, and it also means donkey in the derivative, the negative derivative, which is why several Western leaders used it and continue to use it on occasion. It's done on purpose to communicate our displeasure with them. This is the scene from Raqqa, 
a scene that was replayed throughout villages, Yazidi villages, Kurdish villages, all throughout Iraq, northern Iraq, and Syria itself with that very familiar flag. And here's the cabinet, which looks a lot like a government. Twelve governors of Syria, twelve governors of Iraq, a leadership council, a military council, all the different councils. You might call those cabinets or cabinet departments. It looks exactly like a government and was set up just like this. This has all been rolled back and gone underground, with the exception of al-Baghdadi is broadcasting and communicating on a we at least weekly, sometimes twice or more weekly basis with ISIS adherents. His latest broadcast, I believe, was Saturday or Sunday. I don't have the timing exactly right, but it was over the weekend. And there he is with their organization. Most of the deputies and many of the cabinet members were targeted and have been killed by drones by the United States. Last week, the United States State Department approved a permit for drones, slightly older generation drones, to be sold to eight governments around the world for the first time ever. Which means the targeting by drones, regardless of what you think about that, by some U.S. government entities and related entities of the U.S. government, all of that will now be farmed out to national governments to create target lists. This is a recipe for real disaster, real controversy. We've democratized the targeting system. <coughs> this is al-Baghdadi. <coughs> He's a Ph.D. <coughs> This is from their website. This is their picture. They have their own Time Magazine, which I'm going to show you. It's not called Time Magazine. It's called Dabiq. This is a screen grab from the Dabiq page on Amazon UK. You don't have to pay for it. Do not access this at home. Access Dabiq and an SSU computer or come to my office. My terrorism class, we pass around copies of the beak, we look at it. It's usually between 65 to 85 pages. It tells you all kinds of things. Uh, it tells you who they target, what they believe in, what correct year it is, why they're going after these individuals, how to bake a pie with your mom and then build a bomb in the same oven. Actual issue, okay? Again, you don't have to pay seven or eight pounds for it. You can download it from a number of different places. Just do it in a public space. This is an example of what it looks like. It's full color, full blown, and it's not designed for their targeted populations. Who's the population it's designed for? The West, the United States, France, Great Britain, Germany. It comes in French, English, German, Chinese, Mandarin, Japanese and several 17, 18, 19, something like that versions of Arabic. It's widely, widely available. <coughs> and designed to create this. Designed to create a series of linked or inspired attacks all across the world. Whether that's in Toronto, not directly affiliated, Great Britain, or other areas. Not just those targeted areas. You can find this out and look at this from the START database, which is at the University of Maryland. START, S-T-A-R-T, dot U-M-D, dot E-D-U. It's the official database that creates what's called the Global Terrorism Database, the GTD, which used to be called the Terrorism Resp Resource Depository, the TURD, okay? It's now called the GTD, okay? They didn't think TRD was a good number, or a good acronym and reference, all right? ISIS is dramatically different than al-Nusra, al-Nusra Front, which is an affiliate, an al-Qaeda group. So they consider themselves pure adherents, if you will, of the caliphate and not self-declared. And notice, at least as of July two years ago, 
there are different affiliated offshoot groups that compete with each other in Syria itself. So one of the problems with genof genocide in the Yazidi case and in other cases around Syria is ascribing responsibility to particular terror groups because one of the things we see with extremist groups that operate is with the use of the internet and with their communication, they take responsibility for what's happening. They ascribe responsibility. And we don't see that as much with the Syrian case. So we can chart the data on the TURD, on the Global Terrorism Database at start, but nonetheless, ascribing responsibility, direct responsibility, and having it verified has become a problem. And therefore, that becomes a prosecutorial problem for anything related to ascribing responsibility under international law for crimes of genocide, prosecuting the guilty. Here's why. You have the Free Syrian Army, the Mujahideen Army. You have the Fastakim Union, which is affiliated with the FSA, the Free Syrian Army. You have different battalions. You have opposition factions. Uh, South Front. Southfront.org is the Syrian, one of the Syrian Free Army websites, Southfront.org, which is a very interesting name because you may have heard of or seen pictures of uh, white supremacists marching in Virginia. And their old website is called Stormfront.org. Okay? So I guess you don't want to confuse them, but you'd find interesting things on the web nonetheless. Here's the proxy war that's going on. The creation of proxies, ISIS doing bidding and work, contract work. Four different actors, and on behalf of other belligerents, like the Iranian government, the Russian government, and or the United States at times. So there's an affiliation that goes on here with paramilitary forces, with the intelligence community, with special operators, by irregular forces. You may rec remember the name Blackwater? So since we had Blackwater, or Z, XI, which later became Academy with an I, Academy, like with an I, that's the current name of Blackwater, the Russians had to create their own entity as well. So when you see those Russian website, when you saw the Russian bases and where they were based, they're populated by Russian contract military workers, Russian paramilitaries in that area. <coughs> I'm gonna just, I'll, I'm gonna continue with some more, but uh, any questions so far? I've given you a heck of a lot of material so far. Do you wanna pause and take a question? Please, uh, let's, let's take a couple questions and then we'll come back to it, please. So, uh, okay, you ready? Uh, uh, I wanna go back to show you a map. Um, hold on just a second, because I'm gonna show you a map of what's everything that's going on. It's not a simple question you asked. <laughs> Thanks. Free Syrian Army operating up here as elements of this, but also some of those offshoots. You see those offshoots? Al Qaeda doesn't like the Islamic State, right? They're rivals. What do you think are some elements of Tahrir al Sham and some of these groups? They have elements of Al Qaeda in them and Al Nusra. So those rebel groups include both people that we don't like or didn't like, Al-Qaeda, and elements of that we support through the CIA and the arming of them, s especially since April 2017 next year, or last year. So you still have that, if you will. <coughs> and uh, notice the areas that they're operating in. <coughs> so look what you've got. Islamic State, the YPG, Hezbollah and the Assad regime, and forces that we like and don't like, with elements there. I probably should have added up all of those circles, but uh, let's see, I don't know, uh, 10, 12 different groups with offshoots of those battalions. Remember the things with the battalions? So there isn't one rebel group. There are multiple rebel groups. And, what do we uh, and how do we know rebel groups operate? What do they do to civilian populations if they want to ascribe popula if they want to ascribe atrocities to others. They attack them, and indeed that's what happens. Good question. What else? Please.
So the Russians, let me answer that a couple different ways. The Russian, the estimate, reading in preparation for this, to redo the Syrian oil infrastructure will cost between 35 and 40 billion dollars. That's a really good estimate from a set of strategists that deal with kind of oil price futures. 35 billion, let's say. The Russians believe that their investment, that they can recoup from this, will pay them tons of time over and they can control the flow of oil and be major players in the Middle East for decades to come. That war is costing them in the neighborhood right now of at least 20 million to 40 million a day, at least. So, so they're burning money between 20 and 40 million a day, and they believe they can recoup that by rebuilding the infrastructure that will cost at least $35 billion. The initial, as I recall, the initial investment was about 25 billion, but it's gonna be higher than that, 35 to $40 billion. To re that's to rebuild the infrastructure to then produce and get up to a place where you can produce around 400 to 500,000 barrels of oil a day, and they would have total control of it. Well, I'd have, to, I'd have to run the numbers, 20 to 40, 20 to 40 million dollars a day. It's, it's, it's very difficult because they have ramped up their investment and that doesn't include many of the ships that are off in the Mediterranean because many of those ships are uh, mm, not operating. They're being pulled by tugboats. <laughs> they're there for show of force. So there, I, there's no, it's difficult to, to, to measure it. Um, but let, let, me, let me run some numbers and see, but it's, it's pretty significant. Uh, it is not as costly for as what the Iraq war cost us, ultimately, but uh, at the height of the war, it wasn't costing us much more than 40 million a day. And could be much lower than that. Yeah, Myrna. Okay, excellent question. All right, Sunni and Shia differences. Ready? Who ascribes to what elements of the Quran and when, th when the world started, what happens? with uh, the actual beginning of uh, history. Let me show you Dabiq, one element of this. Thank you, this is a good element to this. Let me see if I can grab. So notice the year 1435, the year 1437, The tr this is just to show kind of the elements of it and how it's advanced for what's happened for recognizing the start of history, the true role of uh, Allah, uh, the true role of the recognition of who uh, and what cities and uh, the role of Mecca versus other areas of uh, here, and if you will, to which degree of element of freedom or the your ability to uh, develop with certain, uh, gosh, what would I say, Myrna? Uh, the degree to which the imam has certain responsibilities or roles as the direct conduit of God. It's much, it's more even complicated than that in terms of Sunni and Shia, but still nonetheless, um, the broad elements of this. And the, the key thing here is to pay very close attention to this divide between Sunni and Shia and the numbers here. The Shia being the dominant uh, group, if you will, of the Iranian role versus the Sunni role, but again, much more uh, problematic than that much more uh, democratized than that, I think you might say. All right, let's get another, yeah, please. Oh, okay, ISIS and ISIL. Um, they're both used interchangeably. ISIL is the uh, original group, I IS is the original group, then ISIL and then ISIS. They're all used interchangeably by the media and by themselves on their websites and uh, through their communication and affiliation, there's no distinct difference other than you might think of them as Al-Qaeda versus Al-Qaeda Central, and then there are break or offshoot groups from that. IS is how it started and then progressed to ISIL and then IS and then ISIS today. Cynthia? Yeah, sorry, I did this as I went there. Okay, great, great questions, by the way. Just to run this thing on. All right, the role of gender. Um, if you looked at and you saw the Yazidi population for what ISIS has done and how they've kind of moved, um, they learned some things from Al-Qaeda. 
uh, and learn some things from uh, the different bombing camp, suicide bombing campaigns that we saw in Israel. Uh, and therefore, uh, women have an important role, but not a leadership role. And they have an important operational role. So first, if you looked at the Yazidi populations and what happened, what you saw were the Yaz Yazidi populations, uh, men and women were both attacked, but women were often separated from them and then taken and used and enslaved, like we've seen with other groups. But from an operational perspective, there have been elements of ISIS in specific areas and instances where they use them as operators and trainers, just like we saw in Lebanon or in Beirut or uh, in areas of Israel in the 1980s, uh, during the Intifada years, and in subsequent kind of bombing campaigns. Uh, they provide training and logistics. We haven't seen them as much as suicide bombers, as we've seen in other areas like in Israel, or the Black Widows, the Chechens, uh, but nonetheless, we've seen some of them, so you see them in the data. But no leadership role, male-dominated organization, almost exclusively, and often subjugated and used the Christian populations, the Yazidi populations, the Kurdish populations for enslavement, but an operational component as well. Uh, not all of these extremist terror groups are, uh, they ha they, there's gender differences. So uh, female suicide bombers, FSBs, uh, are one of the best studied areas of the terrorism literature, for example, and are hugely influential with the poster child being the Chechen female suicide bombers, the Black Widows used uh, in Moscow and different plane bombings, these types of things. Uh, and those, and they have been used uh, in a big way as trainers. And I think this is one element that might be helpful. When the groups, um, when there's a failure, a bomb doesn't go off or someone uh, chickens out or there's a change in the scenario that happens, even those that are not successful are used as trainers and as support staff moving forward. So they're not just like logistics moms. They are also used even in elements of failure to train others about what to do. So there's actually uh, groups that use them in, in big, big ways in that sense. Yeah, please. What the percentage of the Yazidis that were shot down? 78 of the 130. And the percentage of the Russians who were able to get the Russians to the Yazidis? Yeah. Was that the percentage of the Yazidis? Uh, he did say that, and there were 78 of 130 that were shot down. The, the Russians deployed a system called RS-300, which is their most advanced anti-air system, uh, and they operate it. Now, there are Syrian operators on the ground or in those groups, but the Russians are there, and the one reason the Russians are there and the Russian command and control is there is so they won't be targeted, and if they are, Russians will be killed in any broad strike, particularly an aircraft-related uh, strike. <laughs> I have no explanation for why you would say that. I could venture a lot of guesses. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question, but uh, they have a certain, uh, also the strike was, uh, if you, uh, General Dunford, the chief, the joint chief of staff, uh, general the chief of staff, the Pentagon, Secretary Mattis, all of them talked about this very lengthy, broad strike. Again, it all happened in three minutes. Everything was coordinated, it happened in three minutes in the middle of the night. With the air traffic open, or if you will, cleared, and at the same time, there were messages that were sent to the Russians of within the 60-minute period of when we would strike. Okay? So there were all elements to that. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and, and kind of goes to the Sunni Shia thing as well. Uh, okay, so uh, if you look at this, if you see this kind of change in how groups operate and what happens under this kind of terrorism environment, we've seen elements of proxy wars for a long time, colonial wars, uh, invasions, different things that we've seen in Central America, Africa, throughout uh, the colonial era. But what's different here is that you don't just have the great powers going. You have the question about rebels in Syria. You don't just have this element happening, but you also have other components to this of the rivals within the Sunni-Shia split between who will control uh, the future destiny of the Middle East, who will be the leader of the Arab world, whether that is going to be uh, the, Saudi the Saudi royal family or through uh, the Saudi Peninsula, or if it's going to occur through Iran, uh, through the Persian world, for lack of a better term, through 
the Shia world, and that this has an important element to the great power rivalry. The Saudis have been conducting, and the Iranians have been conducting uh, open warfare together since the time we went into Iraq the second time. The Saudis were providing uh, material support to elements of Al-Qaeda. The Iranians were providing their own advisors and their own support for other elements of the insurgency in Iraq. Sometimes allied against the United States, sometimes allied against Western forces, and sometimes allied against uh, who would lead the village or the tribe in that particular area, particularly in southern Iraq. In addition to this, the divide for who would control the destiny and foothold to the expansion of Islam into other areas, like the heart of Africa, through Somalia and the Horn of Africa, through is one reason that we have this open warfare going on in Yemen. But here is kind of the difficulty between this, this rivalry between the Iranians that are trying to move in one direction, the Saudis who have indicated a willingness, for example, to live with Israel, but also control kind of the destiny, the Iranians arguing against this. One element to this that is different and distinct is that the Iranians have been using weapons in the Ye Yemeni civil war that are old U.S. weapons, and the Saudis have been using weapons that are the new, if you will, newer weapons, and the Russians have been funneling, and Bosnian and Serbian warlords have been funning, funneling old Russian weapons with the Iranians into that Yemeni civil war. So that has the, the, the Iranians have become much more about a contract in terms of growing this in that particular area, and the Saudis have been essentially running that proxy war for us for some time. Uh, Yemen is a mess. Uh, the idea, uh, the explanation or idea is that that mess then spins out, if you will, into other areas like Oman or into the Horn of Africa or into the southern part of the Saudi Peninsula. The southern part of the Saudi Peninsula is where we used to run drone activity for Africa before we established the Horn of Africa Command in Djibouti, just as an example. So the Iranians have been trying to leverage this, I think, for some time. Please. Okay, so you see ISIS, uh, you, you s the, the question was, what do we see ISIS as tied to Sunni or Shia? We see them tied to both elements. They have been tied more to the Sunni elements than the Shia, but they have worked with Iran. You see a lot of uh, affiliation of different groups working against the common enemy. And I'm going to phrase this more broadly in terms of your question. If the common enemy is Israel or the West or the United States, you see narco trafficker, narco terrorist groups aligned with white supremacist groups, aligned with other extremist groups, Muslim Brotherhood, uh, Al Qaeda Central, all of this allied against the common enemy. This is exactly how ISIS has operated. Not so much as true adherents, ISIS Central, Baghdadi, what's happening in Iraq, yes, but their affiliate groups have been much more. Uh, flexible about their arrangements with Sunni and Shia groups, mostly Sunni, but not exclusively. That would not be an accurate answer to say. They've worked with both. They've worked with the Iranians at times, have been armed by the Iranians, have bought weapons and technology from the Iranians, have worked with them in some of those areas, but at the same token, uh, at the same time, have also been working with other groups that are affiliated on the Sunni side, especially in Western, uh, in Western Iraq, too. All right? All right, let me go through a couple other things. Uh, all right, so what we see is a, a, a set of huge policy challenges for the United States as a result of this. The negotiation or civil discourse kind of component and how that moves forward. Yes, we do communicate with these groups. What do we do versus civil wars? The challenges for counterterror and insurgency. All of these things in terms of nation building and state building. And here's the problem. Is Syria, Somalia, Yemen, Afghanistan, Probably not Pakistan. Are these failed states or failing states? Failed states or failing states? And that's a huge quandary for us. A failed state assumes that they are fourth world and cannot be rehabilitated. A failing state has conditions as such. So the Syrian case, the spillover of conflict across borders, creates conditions for a failed state, but that hasn't reached that status yet, a failing state, a state that has been failing. There are multiple groups that have looked at this. I'll show you some of that in just a second. But it really has become, if you will, a catastrophic civil war, an irregular hybrid conflict, a conflict that has spun out and involved, if you will, the presence of WMDs and nuclear weapons, where some actors act unilaterally. This is where the Iranians have done more than the Saudis in Yemen. The Iranians have been more willing to act in a unilateral fashion in Syria, in Yemen. 
the Saudis have been using proxies, even though they've used some of their regular Air Force forces to do this. <coughs> Great similarities between the Syrian and North Korea nuclear reactors, by the way, which the Israelis uh, destroyed. And both of, these are, uh, both of these reactors are predicated on a German design that was uh, manufactured in, uh, or really came to fruition in Pakistan. Okay? So this concept of fragile state, failing state, and state failure is important to this component of hybrid war, right? You have civil conflicts, political crisis, massive human rights violations, Aggression doesn't fit into the traditional uh, UN component here. You have collapsing states, collapsed states. So what do these groups provide that the Iranian government, the Saudi government, the United States, or the Russians cannot provide? They provide a social welfare net, a social welfare structure. Hezbollah delivers water, power, education. So what does the cabinet of ISIS deliver? All of those things. They function as quasi-states. The Pentagon has thought about this for some time. There's a famous report called The World in 2030, and the argument is that governments of many of these failed states and failing states don't exist anymore. That provision of water is provided by uh, 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 criminal syndicates, affiliated community-based groups that come together with violent tendencies to provide water and so forth, and power and education and all elements of that together. That government goes by the wayside in these failed states and can never be recovered. And that has important er, ramifications for rules of law, norms of conduct, and so forth. <coughs> so you create constant inherent insecurity and instability. And what does that require if the world is chronically insecure and not stable? It requires strong military. It requires constant military presence. It requires never-ending war which is hugely problematic for us. You have basically spaces that you set forth that are ungoverned. You might think of it as Mad Max's world, or you might think of it as Blade Runner, you might think of it as The Matrix, but what you create are certain spaces that you designate that are ungoverned and can never be recaptured, that just remain a mess, that are lawless and forever in conflict. You're resigning certain parts of the world to a never-ending set of conflict and certain populations and things to kind of chronic, ungoverned, ill-governed, violent spaces, like elements of Syria. So you have to reorder the world as a result. This is, this is the element of hybrid warfare the Russians take advantage of, or what you see in elements of that slide from the Russian general. And this is where information becomes a key component of hybrid war and you create a failed states index. This is by the Fund for Peace. They haven't updated it since then, but they created a fragile states index because this concept doesn't exactly work. Critical failed states are in the red, in danger, in kind of that orange color, and then borderline in the yellow. Look at Russia. Indonesia, but the idea is was if we move from, say, Indonesia and the Philippines on the far right, across the world into Morocco before we get to the Atlantic, you have the arc of instability, which has been a key element of U.S. foreign policy and U.S. security policy since the Balfour Declaration, since World War II. It's been a chronic component, a constant component of U.S. foreign policy. I think it was Kissinger who said that all problems and all solutions originate in the Middle East from Iran as an, as an element of this. And, if, and the Iranians don't mind that so much because where are they in the arc of instability? Squarely in the center, just like we see with many United States maps, just so you know. And the question is whether this is a myth or not. Are these populations really subject, subje subjugated to this kind of chronic failure or failing component? All right. So, now, these groups operate in this environment, but there are really few benefits for them, right? They're under constant threat. They pop up, they go away, they can't govern, they can't move, they can't move the oil, they have difficulties in transportation. It's actually very difficult for them to be successful. 
almost all terror groups and all terror movements end uh, in inhospitable ways. That's a diplomatic way to say it. They end in failure. So why do this? They can't provide infrastructure and security for very long. States have been really successful. But states have also been challenged in how to deal with these groups. And these groups, while they have been not successful, continue to pop up all over. So you get ISIS, Daesh, ISIL, Al-Qaeda here, Al-Qaeda there, affiliations and inspirations. You get constant adaptation by these groups, even though they're not successful. This is the appeal that they provide. They provide competing governance. Not successful governance, but competing governance. They provide the ability to deliver some semblance, not of normalcy, but of government, even though it's a proxy, which means those human rights violations and those atrocities become normal courses and accepted currency of behavior. They become a normal thing or an accepted norm in these failing and failed states. And you see this all over the place in Sudan since the 1970s where the, P uh, the PLO and other groups operated in southern Lebanon, in elements of Karachi, Pakistan, throughout the Kurdish region, throughout the Afghanistan-Pakistan border, throughout the, s the, the Caucasus regions, southern Russia. This creates inherent instability and ongoing challenge and destroys the idea of the Treaty of Westphalia or most of, if you will, Western law that's governed relations between nation states since 1648, since World War I, since World War II, and since. All right, I'll leave it there. Thank you all very much. Hold on, I think we're going to take a few questions, I think. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, yeah. Here, do you want, can we, we keep, do you want that one from her? Thank you. Mine's on. There we go. Um, I noticed in one of your, when you were showing the uh, relationships between the different countries and groups, Israel stands alone. But you have it there for a reason, I think. And what you had to say sort of explains the Israeli intransigence. Um, uh, No, it was the one with all of the allegi the uh, connections. The s Forward, yeah. Who supports who? The, the forward. No, keep going. Keep going. Towards the end, yeah. Well, the most important thing is that Israel is just there. They're not supported by anybody or supporting anybody. Okay, so uh, the Israelis have been operating with the Jordanians and to some elements of this. They've been concerned about what's going on in Lebanon. ISIS has been operating in Lebanon more frequently with bombings going up. The Syrians have been operating in that area. The small element of Druze in that area. And the Israelis have been operating with some of these various groups. They are hugely concerned that ISIS goes under or down. You looked and saw where those Russian bases were, mostly affiliated in the south to Damascus and moving over to the ocean, the United States in that area. 
but I saw that US forces moving down, showed you that one element. The area as you move down into northern Jordan, into areas that are in Saudi Arabia, that, what's, that, that lawless open area is what concerns the Israelis a great deal because there's, there's, no, there's no one operating in that area. So they're worried that this process becomes or these groups become mobile, spill over and move around, and they're the only ones left to deal with it because the United States can't continue its pace of operation. The Trump administration believes that that gives them leverage to create some type of peace deal because it forces the Israelis to accept the current neighborhood. And the Israelis resist this in a huge way. The, president is re the Trump administration is relying on the Israelis being practical about the new normal. That may be a misestimate or a misstep, but he's relying on that. And the Israelis have to demonstrate that they won't rely on the new normal. They won't accept it. They have been engaged with the Saudis in funding forces against the Iranians, against the Shias, from the beginning of that Yemeni civil war. We don't talk about that very much, but the Israelis have been operating in that theater with the Saudis, which ticks off some elements of Damascus and what's happening, which creates that instability. But part of that is they're worried about the gr not the growing influence of the Russians to their north, but the growing influence of the United States to walk away. And they need to demonstrate that. Bit of a complicated picture, but a very good question. Um, if the Dabiq is such a, like, ter if it's like a terrorist literature, why can you buy it on Amazon? Why is it so easy to uh, get access to? O okay, so uh, that screen grab of Amazon was from 2015. I don't think you can still buy it, but you can widely get it from, like, the Avalon Law Project at Yale. You can get all back issues, it's all widely available. The point is to disseminate the information. The point is to provide their point of view, to understand the rec their reference point for when history began, for what they recognize as legitimate actors in, in Islam and those that are illegitimate and those that are a threat. It's, it's, not, it's not just a propaganda piece, it's a learning piece. It has an ideological component, it has a theoretical component, and it has a practical component, and it hits all of those. So you have to disseminate it, and it's really professionally well done. Al-Qaeda used to do this. They used to produce an, uh, a publication like this, and the person who produced it uh, was born in Northern Virginia. He was an American. He was targeted 11 times, and on the 12th time, he was killed by a drone uh, with no trial or anything like this by the Obama administration. But that element of creating a consumable media piece, and it, it's quite extensive. I mean, it is usually 65 to 75, 65 to 80 pages. It's no small time magazine. But the idea is to create a legitimacy and understanding, a seriousness, and to, indic and to indicate that to us and our leaders, our intelligence community, and also to possible adherents. So it has a, 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 a certainly a, a derived purpose. I think Amazon has taken it off, uh, but it is widely and easily available. Again, do not download it at home, unless you don't like that person. Uh, it is widely available. Anyone else? I can show you a couple more elements if you want. It's up to you. Okay, all right. Hold on. Cindy, if you see that slide, tell me. <laughs> There, okay, <laughs> excellent, sorry, all right. Uh, yeah, you notice I kept the Israelis uh, on their own. Man, Martin, you picked that up, that was excellent. Uh, yes, uh, because they're, they're uh, it's difficult to say this, but they're a free agent operating here. It's, it's a transactional relationship. They're relational to what's happening, so they have elements to this all over, and influences. But they're terribly worried about the United States walking away. Please. Yeah, the, Ger the, the, Ger yeah, the, the Germans, um, and I, I may, wh what would be helpful for this is to maybe put them on by size of, of act level of activity. Maybe that'd be the right way to do it, to give you a relative idea, a 3D 
element to that. That's a good, I can, I can certainly do that. I can alter this. Okay. Uh, just to show you what's happening in the ISIS-related areas, this is from the Institute of Study of War. This is old ISIS, to give you an idea of that roadmap. These are some elements that I showed you last year, I, which is why I put them in the appendix. <coughs> See the Kurds? You know, we, tr we talk about the Kurds more broadly as one group. <laughs> there's the KDP, the PUK, and there's elements of that split off as well. So none of these groups are really homogenous, if you want to think of it that way, along with the YPG. And it gives you an idea of how they're operating in those river valleys. First, areas that they support, or they're able to move through terror, that would be the brown areas here, versus those that are attack zones where they're active, the red zones, versus those that they control. Notice that their element of control is dispersed, even though they were controlling at one point over the borders with Iraq and Syria elements with the Yazidi in the north there between Sinjar and Mosul. Most of the Yazidis. With a presence that extended all throughout Iraq. Really reaching a crescendo in summer of 2014. Like this. This is to show you what it looks like on the ground for how they would operate. These are some of the screen grabs um, from uh, the satellite feeds from South Front and other websites. And there's the roadmap from the Australian government for your drive through Syria, through the different regions. Don't worry, it gets better. This is to give you an idea of areas to avoid for ISIL. Avoid Raqqa. There's your map to show you elements of that. All right, let me leave it there. Thank you all again very much.